Hey everyone, this is Ari Yu here, chair of the U.S. Blockchain Coalition, powered by the WTIA, the largest technology industry association in the U.S. Thinking about changing things up uh, going forward as we head into 2023, so started right away, um, especially with the latest FTX and SBF and all of that debacle that's been going on this year in 2022. I think all of us need to take a step back and just think through a lot more things, um, do a lot more due diligence, really dig into the details and double click on what's really going on, on definitions, on just everything. Be a lot more crystal, crystal clear and intentionally. And so with that, um, I was uh, poking around on LinkedIn over this last weekend while I was at the Texas Blockchain Summit and uh, discovered this guy named Jimmy who was asking a lot of interesting questions on Ethereum. And I had some answers and some answers I wasn't so sure about. And so I thought I'd throw a quick uh, get together uh, via Zoom. And so this is a recorded chat with myself, Steve, of course, uh, Jimmy, and I brought back Mark, Mark Unsteed, uh, because he's just very knowledgeable about Ethereum and has a nice, um, nice demeanor and um, very personable, professional way about talking about things. Um, I wanted to just have some civil professional discussion from two people that may not agree with everything. I didn't want to become toxic or angry. And so we had a nice conversation clarifying some stuff about Bitcoin and Ethereum and the different mental models and frameworks that uh, each have. I hope you enjoy this. It's only about an hour. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, it was really, really interesting to just pick up a little bit of the nuances and understanding. And um, I hope you learn as much as we did. Uh, so uh, enjoy. Uh, don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and let us know if you have any questions or suggestions, and thank you so much. Bye. All right, so let's begin with a quick set of intros because, um, Jimmy, I'm new to you, but I've been following your um, questions for a little while now, and I think they're really good questions. Uh, so let's get off, kick off with a quick intro of Jimmy, your background, and how did you get into the space with all these questions? And then um, I know Mark, but not everyone knows Mark. So Mark, your you know, quick background too. So Jimmy, you want to kick it off? Hey, so uh, my name is Jimmy, Jimmy Toussaint. Um, you know, I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. I actually uh, started my first job like in my life. I'm pushing 40, so this is the first job I've ever had nice. in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, in token economics, essentially, it just you know designing, uh, doing a lot of token design and and all that good stuff for uh, venture funded companies. Uh, but previously, I had an ad tech company uh, in West Africa. I mean, I own a bunch of businesses now. I, you know, I started out in the space as like a, a degen yield farmer back when it was cool, wow. you know, before before Uniswap was uh. I had a billion dollars LTV and then and, and so I got airdropped a bunch of useless uh you know food tokens that ended up being worth a lot of money and then sort of but it was my first uh my first entry into crypto. Uh, wow. but ever since then, I mean I I knew a bunch of Bitcoin maxis ever since school. I was studying computer science uh, in school and you know um you know when I got in this space and and I I'm blessed to have had a bunch of just OGs, guys that have been in Bitcoin since 2011, 2012, sort of hold Whoa. my hand and teach me a lot. Yeah, like these- That's super like, OG. They're, they're absolute, they're absolute <laughs> whales. Yeah, like absolute whales. We're talking about like, you know, guys that were involved with like, you know, even the concept of like NFTs and like, you know, they was all sort of on Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, it's all sort of Bitcoin, you know, side chains over there, et cetera. So, um, and yeah, so I learned a lot, became sort of a, a Bitcoin maxi, but I'm I'm a, I'm a little different though. Like I'm a I'm not like a I'm not toxic in the sense where it's like ah you can't do anything else, you know. I, I like I'm, I'm more of like a truth maxi. It's like okay, you do whatever you want. Truth just, maxi. just be real. Yeah, just be real about what you're doing. Just, just let's not market yourself as something other than what you're actually doing, right? Mm -hmm. So you know, that's my position on on uh, everything. And yeah, that's a gist of my background. Cool. Well, really great to meet you. And uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your uh, day to uh, quickly jump on a call with us and uh, talk this through. And then Mark, intro of yourself. 
For sure. Yeah. Jimmy, yeah. it's a pleasure to meet you. And um, to anybody else who's listening, hello. Uh, my name is Mark. Um, I've been in the crypto space for, for quite some time. I started investing back in like 2014. I've um, been working full time since 2017. Um, founded multiple companies, uh, done some stuff around like the VC side um, with uh, some of those companies that I have founded and a couple others helping them to raise rounds, um, primarily working around like the BD side of things. Um, I'm not like an actual like builder myself. I don't even really know how to code, but uh, I can get into the uh, into the nitty gritty side of things for the most part. Um, and yeah, it's uh, I guess a little bit about my background. Um, similar to Jimmy was uh, kind of kind of missed the old 2020 days where you could kind of punt your money into random food coin. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Uh, fortunately, I don't think we're going to get that again, but um, it was. Uh, those were those were the golden days um but uh yeah so i guess that's a quick overview of my background i've been building around the ethereum ecosystem for for a few years now um just love playing around with new innovative things and um seeing how they can be applied to i guess improve existing infrastructure and um i guess real world infrastructure uh so yeah, I guess that's a quick overview of my background. Awesome. Thank you so much, Mark, for joining us again. Um, myself, I uh, work in the policy side right now, and uh, I've also played in the VC world and also serial entrepreneur myself. I think all of four of us actually serial entrepreneurs, so that's really, really awesome. And uh, now I play in the education space, and I think my pet peeve is the devil's in the details. And so when someone's like double clicking on something, I'm like, oh, that's actually really good. So I can learn a little bit more. There's a lot of nuances in the space and I think that's what makes it really hard. Um, and it makes it also really easy for people to get mad at each other very quickly and unnecessarily. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I think getting to clarity and especially now after the whole SBF, FTX, et cetera, debacle, it's even more important for us to kind of slow down and ask these questions and do it very thoughtfully. Uh, Steve, you, you're joining us. Thank you so much for joining us. He's my uh, co-educator with me. You want to do an intro? Yeah, thanks, Ari. Hey, Jimmy and Mark, good to see y'all. Uh, and uh, Jimmy, uh, nice to meet you. Um, we, uh, yeah, so so for me, I'm, I'm a former safety engineer. Um, I, I've worked in aerospace and, and worked on uh, airplanes and spaceships and uh, got introduced to Web3 and the concept of Web3 a few years ago and became sort of a crypto, you know, uh, a retail investor and just sort of started going down the rabbit hole and just went further and further and further. And then and next thing you know, I'm kind of involved in, uh, you know, helping Ari explain things and, and you know, ended up on the education side of it. And uh, I really enjoy it. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I am a builder. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I do, I have my own company and um, I'm co-founder of a couple of other companies and you know, decidedly web two, but, you know, we're, you know, right now I'm, I'm really anxious to see what can be built in web three and how all this other stuff shakes out and what kind of regulations we're going to be looking at in the next five, 10 years um, and what we can do within it. Uh, Cause I think it is um, very disruptive, very uh, revolutionary. And uh, I think the future is bright, but man, it is foggy right now. Um, so <laughs> we got a lot of growing. Uh, we're just, scratching the surface. So that's pretty much me. Thanks, y'all. Cool. Thank you, Steve. All right. To kick it off, we're talking about all things Ethereum, E-T-H-E-R-E-U-M. Um, and so I'm going to kick it off with just uh, what I read and um, some questions and then ask um, Jimmy for maybe more background or context on where this question or thoughts came from and then see if Mark can offer us some more clarity on you know, our understanding or confirm or deny um, where we are or even point to us to some resources because, you know, not everyone knows everything all the time, which is okay. It's okay to say, I don't know. I wanted to say that. Um, and, you know, maybe point us to where we can look next um, in finding that answer. So it looks like, you know, Ethereum Foundation, uh, we moved to Ethereum 2.0 uh, proof of stake recently with this thing called the merge. Um, and so, you know, there's a couple questions around like, one, you know, is Ethereum 2.0 a hard fork or a soft fork? And how do you determine that? 
um, because um, it seems to be maybe a point of contention uh, around, you know, what is it? Is it a hard fork or soft fork? And then, um, you know, the last hard fork with Ethereum was back in July of 2016, remember with a DAO hack with a 51% attack. And so Vitalik Ethereum Foundation decided, you know, the best thing forward was um, to move to Ethereum uh, where it became ETH versus ETC, right? ETC is the uh, old Ethereum, original Ethereum. And then now with this post merge, whether it's a hard fork or soft fork, we'll talk about that. It looks like we can't withdraw. So if anybody um, put their ether into the proof of stake um, pool before the merge, they were promised that they could withdraw their stake after a certain period of time, either after the merge or after six months after the merge or after six to 12 months after the merge or now maybe potentially in 2024, which is more than 12 months after the merge. Um, and you know the most latest is that you can withdraw after the Shanghai upgrade, which is yet to be determined on when that'll complete. Did I miss anything, Jimmy, or please add more context? Yes, uh, you didn't miss anything. In fact, I there's a there's a lot more context to to add here because okay. it's an it was an ongoing conversation, okay. and there were a lot of presumptions that I made in in the thread of that conversation that I no longer I don't make those presumptions anymore because mm -hmm. I was corrected on a lot of things. Oh, good. The thing is, I I was wrong about what was going on but for very like good reasons, if that makes sense. Like I, so I, I'm looking at Ethereum or I was looking at Ethereum with the hat of a Bitcoin maxi, right? There are mm -hmm. rules that we follow on my side that seems to not apply um, to Ethereum. Mm -hmm. I made presumptions because it's supposed to be Ethereum is a blockchain based protocol. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. unaware that the people at Ethereum weren't using blockchain technology the way it was actually designed to be used and so to, 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 to which which is where my disconnect was right okay and so like and this is gonna be this is I, this should take like three or four minutes just this Go, please, sort please. Of breaking this down yeah there, there's this analogy i like to use uh, imagine you know imagine there's a mechanic it's been a mechanic for 20 years right mm -hmm. somebody brings their car in to get fixed mm -hmm. opens up the hood mm -hmm. he's he can't find that little stick to hold the hood up. He's looking mm -hmm. everywhere. He <laughs> finds a, he finds something else to hold the hood up. It doesn't work. It falls. He's frustrated. His nephew, mm -hmm. who's never worked on cars before, opens the hood, finds a stick right away. It's actually at a location where it's never supposed to be. Mm. Right? Mm. And so the, the mechanic was blinded by the years of experience where it's supposed to be here. I've been working on cars. It's supposed mm. to be here where the kid because he never worked on cars, he was, he was looking at locations where it wasn't supposed to be, and he found it. He found the answer. Mm. That's what happened to me. Mm. <laughs> That's what happened to me. So mm. there are these presuppositions when you're using, especially on the Bitcoin side, there, there are these absolutes, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So for, for Bitcoiners, the absolute, mm -hmm. for us, the, the unchanging truth is 21 million Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's, our, it's our constitution, it doesn't change any upgrade we do. Any like there was a there was a, a bug, an inflation bug in 2010, mm -hmm. right? That where we had to roll back the Bitcoin blockchain, which is a cardinal sin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, because essentially it's like a hard, it's basically like a hard fart, right? Mm -hmm. But because the blockchain was rolled back with the intent to preserve that that unchanging rule of million bitcoin everything we're doing is with is, is within consensus right mm -hmm. right where ethereum mm -hmm. there is no and what i learned through my discussions is there is no absolute consensus is whatever the group wants to do at that particular time mm. which is very very different right mm. and so and so when i'm having these discussions I'm like, mm -hmm. how, how can you send ETH into a beacon chain, right? Where there's mm -hmm. no withdrawal function and then undo that. The smart track, the, the smart, smart contract is immutable. You can't change something like that. Whereas on Ethereum, it's like, no, 
with consensus, we can definitely change it, which I had to learn that nothing on Ethereum is immutable. Mm. I, I had to learn that, mm -hmm. which now, which, which now sort of now I'm like having the discussion with people that are in Ethereum. Well, why are you then using a blockchain? Because like the, the invention of Bitcoin and blockchain is one and the mm -hmm. same. Blockchain mm -hmm. technology didn't exist before Bitcoin. Bitcoin mm -hmm. didn't exist before blockchain, block, blockchain mm -hmm. technology, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so you, it doesn't make sense to use blockchain technology if, you weren't, if you're not using it to preserve an absolute truth. Like, and that, like it's, it's, you're, supposed to be, it's, you're supposed to be using a, block, a blockchain to, to, to mm -hmm. protect against censorship, right? Mm -hmm. to, to protect against the change of a trans transfer of data from one point to another, period, mm -hmm. full stop. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. the only use case. And so when you have a system in which consensus can change, it, it, it sort of goes against the use case of blockchain technology itself because there's no absolute to protect, right? Well, and so that, that was the disconnect that I, that I was having, uh, you know, and go ahead. So then it takes us to like, what is the definition of blockchain, right? Usually when I go off on my, uh, my soapbox, I say blockchain is, immutable it's decentralized it's permissionless it's public it's global um all of these things and then most other blockchain technologies are more like blockchain based technologies uh, that are actually more like distributed ledger technology they're like private blockchains or consortium blockchains or hybrid blockchains or enterprise blockchains that take that are blockchain based and they take some attributes from the original blockchain definition uh, but are not checking the box for all the the characteristics of blockchain from the Bitcoin definition. Um, and so now what you're actually pointing out is Ethereum is a blockchain versus like blockchain um, because it is cool. not immutable. It may be Clearly. decentralized, permissionless, yeah. global, et cetera, but the immutability part is actually changing as we've seen. I... So nothing is immutable. Yeah, you, that's yeah. yeah, that's very. And but but the thing is, there's only one use. There's only one legit use case for blockchain technology, and that is sent to to transfer data from one point to another without it being censored. Any other, there is no real other legit use case. I mean, look, we created a shovel to move dirt, right? You could use a shovel as a weapon. It's not the most efficient <laughs> weapon, right? You, mm -hmm. could, you could also use a shovel to maybe hold the tent up. It's not the mm -hmm. most efficient tool just because you're mm -hmm. using it in that manner. There's a reason why in which we created that tool in the same mm -hmm. way that there's a reason why in which we created block, blockchain technology. And so mm -hmm. Ethereum is using the, the technology outside of what it was even created for. And so that, mm -hmm. was, that was where I was completely you know, wrong. I was under the presumption that they were using it correctly. The mental yeah. model is different. It's yes. a different mental model and different framework. Yes. Yeah, I can see that. Mark, microphone to you. Can you help us like piece together from, you know, you, you're like super knowing in Ethereum world, at least compared to me. Mm -hmm. um, can you help us? Thoughts? Yeah. yeah, I mean, so some of the points, um, some of the points that Jimmy made are are correct. So the like the mindset of of how Bitcoin works versus Ethereum works very different. So with, with Bitcoin, similar to like, you have the constitution, the constitution does not change. Um, and anybody who like goes against that is like against like the realm of like the mindset of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, with Ethereum, uh, the sort of mindset is that technology evolves and so can the, uh, the way that that technology can be used can also evolve. Um, so that's why there's like different types of what are known as like Ethereum improvement proposals, different ways mm -hmm. that other technologies can be introduced um, to whether it's like the protocol layer, or the application layer, um, different things like that. And that's where different types of forks uh, can be introduced. Um, mm -hmm. So the aspect of that can have different types of pros and cons. With With Bitcoin, obviously, you have uh, basically this solid layer, it does not, I, I would say it doesn't necessarily evolve. It can uh, further decentralize. And from like the currency perspective, 
Um, it can be owned in a more decentralized manner, um, sort of over time. Um, with Ethereum, it's basically, okay, we're continuing to try to see where we can, I don't want to say push the boundaries, but how can we continue to evolve this, this core technology uh, to continue to make it better? There are risks associated with that because you're obviously introducing uh, new things to the protocol layer or through different types of, whether it's like a soft fork or a hard fork. Um, mm -hmm. And there, there, there are different types of risk factors um, associated with that. Um, and so that's just kind of like the different mindset. And right now, I would say probably for the next, I'd say the next three to five years, uh, Ethereum as a blockchain is going to be going through the most amount of change um, in its entire life cycle. Um, so in its infancy, there weren't too many changes uh, that necessarily happened, like at like the protocol layer, how new things were being introduced. Um, after we saw the merge, excuse me, after we saw the merge uh, go live, that's kind of like this, I would say this kickstart, um, maybe even going back to like EIP 1559 with the London upgrade, uh, we're starting to see a lot of new uh, functionalities, features introduced to the actual protocol um, and to the blockchain itself and how data is managed, how data is stored, uh, how consensus operates. Um, there are a lot of evolvements which is happening, and that can have different types of pros and cons. Uh, you can have better evolvements with how data can be managed. Um some people can go one way or another with like proof of stake, proof of work. And I'm not really trying to go down that rabbit hole. Personally, I'm indifferent on either one. Um, but uh, there are involvements with how like data is able to be managed. Um, so there's going to be like the introduction, um, like the Verkle trees, there is going to be introductions with uh, proto dank sharding. Um, there's obviously like this, end goal with ETH 2.0 to introduce sharding. Will that happen in the next like couple years? Who knows? Um, but it's kind of like this roadmap that they have for how they see like the blockchain evolving in of itself. Um, so it's not, it was never really built to be okay. We're, we're launching this blockchain and we're going to sort of let it live. They built this, initial solution is V1. And they're, the goal is to can you continue to iterate off of it um, mm -hmm. so it can continue to grow in that manner. Um, and uh, I, I would say for that part specifically, like a really good um, overview to sort of see what the future might hold. Don't really want to throw any like timelines or anything like that, but what the future will potentially hold um, around Ethereum, there was a uh, roadmap that got released. I believe it was like earlier this year, um, essentially outlining everything that's looking to be done there, um, giving people an idea as what's been completed, um, where we're at in terms of percentage of completion, quote unquote, percentage of completion, um, and how close we are to completing some of those roadmap items. Um, mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, so that's kind of like I would say like the the overview of of what's kind of going on there. I, I think this roadmap that's on the Ethereum Foundation uh, website has changed, right? Like there's from looking at the uh, the posts, there's like a February eighth update, a July twenty second update, and now like there's no roadmap officially on the website. Is that correct? Oh, I, I I don't know offhand. I haven't I haven't looked at yes, it. Yes, that is correct. It kept changing, and now you know. Previously, I was debating against mm -hmm. that, but now that I understand what the position is, mm -hmm. you know, it. I think, you know, I'm not anti Ethereum. I'm not like I said. I'm not that kind of maxi. It's just tell me what you just be upfront about about what you guys are about. That's it. So that. You know, I'd, I'd expect, you know, I'd have, I'd, I'd, I'd expect, I guess, these changes, right? At the end of the day, I find that Ethereum markets itself is one thing, but is, is completely 
different as a as a protocol as an organization as a community right i mean what what was it a world computer right they were, mm-hmm. we're building the world computer you know mm-hmm. we want to decentralize compu- you know computation right mm-hmm. uh, that's fine that's the end I, if you ask well, what do you want to you know use your computation uh, computational power for anything anything that requires computation okay fine that's the end then if that's the goal you know ethereum wouldn't have hard forked when they were 51% attacked right if that was the goal is computation itself right mm. it, like what why why are all these shifts why shift over from proof of work to proof of stake if computation was the goal decentralized computation it's like there is no real goal it shifts to however however consensus the company and the core devs feel right there's no reason for it and 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 so the 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 community sort of speaks about consensus in a very weird way because consensus mm-hmm. is something different in, in ethereum for it's it, it isn't as if the the people who mined ethereum agreed with the move to proof of stake they invested in all of this equipment in fact if they agreed to moving over to proof of stake there wouldn't have been a need for a difficulty bomb to force these people to stop mining mm-hmm. so the, the the existence of a difficulty bomb is proof that people didn't even want to you know, even didn't want to lose their investment of all these GPU machines that they, to mine ETH, right? And so, it, it, just be, you know, truthful about what's actually happening, and then there wouldn't be any arguments because you'll know what you're buying into when you start participating in that ecosystem. I think that I think that's my position on, on it. I mean, I, I think with with regards to I, I guess the concept of I guess having like proof of work and moving into proof of stake that has been something that has been communicated since like 2015, 2016, for the most part, like that's always been like an initial plan. So for a lot of people who were going in, investing into miners um, and specifically like GPUs, um, I mean, that's something that they knew would eventually happen. Um, Obviously it took significantly longer than everyone planned or expected um but in the end it ended up being executed on um i do know that a lot of the companies that do own those miners they heavily invest obviously they heavily invested into that those pieces of hardware uh so they now had to go and take that hardware and begin to mine elsewhere uh whether that's like ethereum classic or other um blockchains that require that similar type of of hardware um, or they're just doing like regular AI computation data um, or computational data. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily like a bad thing. Um, I, I think for the most part that they have been very communicative uh, in terms of like what is planned and what's sort of expected. I don't think that there should be any, I guess, one of the things that I have learned from working in technology is giving a timeline should never really be understood as like, this is what the actual timeline is going to be. Um, Very rarely, especially like in this industry, are any timelines actually met, um, especially when we're dealing with a lot of new things. Um, So I'm not opposed to when like delays occur or things like that. Obviously, if if active development is continuing to happen and they're working towards that goal or working towards executing on specific KPIs, then that's, in my opinion, the most important part out of that. Um, Because obviously like moving from proof of work to proof of stake took like three or four years longer than what it uh, was expected. Will like, for example, like the Shanghai upgrade, will that take longer uh, than expected? We don't know. Um, For example, like I know on when they were like previously communicating it, um, I guess leading up to the merge, um, they were saying it would be at least like six to 12 months. So like from like the semantic side of things, most people expected six to 12 months, but could it potentially be longer? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, but I think that there's downsides for what's happening there. Um, but on the other side of things, 
that's how they essentially planned to um, essentially run consensus on the network. Um, and yeah. Um, yeah there's, there's, a, there's a lot of unknowns, man. It's a lot of unknowns, Jesus yeah. Christ, especially after taking people's money. Yeah. When can I get a return? Oh. You know, like it's, it's, you know, it's, it's really bad business. It's just, but you know, it's not my, look, I get it. If, if, if you're a part of that community and that's okay, that's fine. But you know, when you're in the public market, you know, uh, saying that there's an opportunity for yield, if you put up 32 ETH and you have Which people, right. With you and you have a lot of people over here yield farming, you know, because at the time that they were doing it, Yield farming was popular. You did have a, a good number of people that aren't necessarily tied to the Ethereum community. They're not up to date on the Ethereum community. They're already mining, you know, for tokens, you know, whether it's Uniswap, whether it's Curve and et cetera. Yep. So they already trust that they'll probably get, you know, yield from Ethereum itself as a layer one, right? And, and, <laughs> You know, there's no timeline now. It's been locked for years, right? It's just. Yeah. So I, I think what that really boils down to, like specifically what you have said, I, I think the Ethereum Foundation has done a good job communicating things on their end. I think what the remainder of that boils down to is everybody else that is communicating on, on how these things work. Um, because like you can just go and say they're, that you're able to generate yield like you could go and get dividends on a stock, but there's also downside risk um, for getting that dividend. The stock could basically plummet. Um, obviously, you could go and sell that stock, which is a, a little bit different in that regard. Um, but um, it really boils down to other organizations, other people saying, okay, if you're going to go and stake and essentially lock up your ETH, uh, there is no timeline in terms of when that will be able to be withdrawn. You will that be not that was not communicated when people were staking on the beacon chain. It was six it was. months, six months after merge, and it and that kept changing on the website. And you know, I know that's the narrative, you know. And look, I'm okay with it now. Now that I understand it, here at Ethereum, we change our minds a lot. Nothing is immutable. We we, we don't follow any of the principles that you're supposed to follow when you're using blockchain te technology. We change our minds. We're, we're a really expensive Excel spreadsheet. You know, <laughs> we pay X amount of dollars. We pay X amount of dollars to change the information on our Excel spreadsheet. That's what we are. Once that's clear, it's like, okay, I accept it. But that wasn't, that wasn't communicated to people that were staking at all. It was six months after merge. Then it went from six to 12 months. Uh, then it went to 2024. Now there is no timeline. And that's really bad business. That's really, really bad business. So from, from my end, it was never my understanding that there really was like a specific timeline. All I knew is that it would be occurring during the next main hard fork after the merge, which was planned to be, or I guess maybe still is planned to be uh, the Shanghai upgrade. Um, I believe that is still part of the plan for... Um, people being able to withdraw their stake. Um, I don't think that that has changed. Um, I do know timelines in terms of like development process can change um, because you're building and you're shipping code um, like that, that, that can change. Uh, there's no like guarantee in terms of when something will, will potentially occur. Um, and yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know if there's like any way to say like, okay, like this is like guaranteed to happen um, just because you're, it, it comes down to how efficiently that code can be shipped and, and executed on. Um, and I think that's, that's so, is really. So like putting on the venture hat, like um, not, not everyone that participates in Ethereum, let alone crypto, is an accredited investor. So they're not necessarily the most experienced people when dealing with money, right? And uh, when you work with a stock, you know that you can sell it even if it goes down um, and you can get instant liquidity like you need to pay bills, right? 
uh, when you invest in startups or you invest in the private markets, and crypto is a good example of that, um, we thought, um, it's really hard to know when you're going to get liquidity, right? I invest in a startup, I might get liquidity or a way to exit in three years if I'm like really lucky and it was a blockchain company that IPO'd after two years, which has happened before. But typically it's like eight to 10 years if you're lucky too, because it's really hard to get an exit as an angel investor. Otherwise, everybody would do be doing it, right? But with crypto, a lot of folks assume that you could get liquidity right away. Like it's really fast. And that's what we've been trained to do. And in crypto, you get like liquidity and you can take out your money anytime you want really, really fast. And there's, yes, there's on ramps and off ramps and it can take a little time, but generally really, really fast. What I'm hearing is if you participate in Ethereum proof of stake, that liquidity was assumed to be later, um, six months, 12 months, a year or so. But now we don't know if it's gonna be actually like a year, two years, three years, five years, because development does take time and actually participating in proof of stake in Ethereum is actually more like venture or private equity investing. Liquidity is actually long, which is typically for more experienced um, investors that have a lot more um, risk, risk tolerance, right? They, they're not playing with scared money, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily who actually participated in proof of stake to date because we didn't know that. And maybe that is why Gary Gensler, SEC guy said, if you are staking with proof of stake, that's actually going to be acting more like a security or something that a more experienced accredited investor should be dealing with. Um, at first, I couldn't really understand why, but maybe this is why. What do you think? Potentially just be I, like, I, I don't know the full reasoning around it. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe like maybe his reasoning for that is because like the assets are are not able to be withdrawn. I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe it's because like you're receiving yield uh, because no, you have an asset to take. It's because it's so it's it's you know strictly because you're participating. So basically, your yield is based on your participating of supporting the network itself. So like mm -hmm. it's not like you're staking like a lot of DeFi protocols are just vaporware. Like they're minting tokens on the back end, and there's a market. You know, there's a spot price for it, and you're selling at spot. You know, and that's a gray area, but mm -hmm. with proof of stake, it's pretty explicit. You're staking mm -hmm. it. So you're offering your, your, your assets to then support mm -hmm. the network itself. And as the mm -hmm. network generates revenue, you're getting a yield on that revenue. That, that's a security. a security. You're staking to eat some steak. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a security. <laughs> and so they're right in the right and in, 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 in sort of identifying that. Um, so, so with that, with that mindset, then like what is your what is your framework in terms of like the consensus mechanism with proof of work would you consider like hardware devices to be considered like technically securities and that those should only be purchasable by people who are essentially accredited because if you are saying that then you're essentially participating in network consensus and receiving yield uh, for running computation, similar to what you do with Ethereum. Um, yeah. So the the people that are offering miners are service providers. So here, you guys marry, under proof of stake, you're marrying mm -hmm. both a node, uh, somebody who's running a node and mm -hmm. someone who's supporting the network. It's like they're one and the same, right? Whereas mm -hmm. uh, somebody who's running a node doesn't necessarily have to, run any mining machines they're, they're decoupled and so you could essentially be a miner and not run a node at all you're essentially just providing you know power electricity in exchange for bitcoin does that make sense so you could still run a light node on ethereum you don't have but it's to decoupled from the mining equipment itself yeah i could run a node on my laptop but that's not necessarily coupled with the equipment itself i'm selling this computing power in exchange for Bitcoin. That's a service. And I can run a node separately on whatever laptop I own. 
or whatever computer I own. It's separate. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so then what would essentially be the security with that regard on like the Ethereum side? Would it be because like... there's no there's no selling, you're not selling anything other than the your 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 asset, the digital it's your money. You're locking up the asset. Yeah, you're locking it up. So that's your financial contribution to the network. And they're not necessarily being... so I do want to clarify something there because you aren't necessarily locking it because you can lose your stake. Uh, since you are dealing with proof oh. of stake, you can technically lose all of your assets. Yes, yes. like if you don't want to, up, like, I guess, update whatever software, right? You could do a sharding, right? I get that, right? Is it because of sharding or maybe you're you're trying to... There's a few different scenarios where yeah, you, yeah. Could, you can lose your stake. But like... you're out of consensus, right? So if you're out of consensus, you would be punished by, by, right. by being out of consensus. Yes, still a security. Right, still mm -hmm. security, because like it's, it's, if if I'm contributing to this entity, my 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 financial, because it is a financial asset, right? It's mm -hmm. it's worth money. It has a market, you know, it's liquid, right? It has a spot price, um, and I contribute that to now support this network. And every time somebody uses the network, I get a share of the profits. Mm -hmm. It's a security. But you're also being paid to help secure that network and store that data. Yes, it's all one and the same. But you, because it's coupled, it's a security. Mm. Right. So the expectation that, is that there will be a return. Um, yes, that's the exactly. You know? I, I don't. I don't necessarily agree with that. There is no necessarily expectation. The expectation that you're given is from other people saying that you're going to be paid by doing this because it's happened previously. There's no guarantee that people are going to continue to use the network and pay to use the network. Right. Uh, there, there's no guarantee for that. Yeah, that's the risk you take when you make an investment. Yeah, and I'm just, and, and Mark, I'm just looking at it from the SEC side, right? That's mm -hmm. kind of part of their Howey test is that there's an expectation that something that you're contributing to uh, generates something for you in return, right? Um, and it, with all the nuances in between. Um, hmm. I think it's part of my theory of why there may be really extended delays. It's because of that challenge. What you challenge? Know? It's it's legal clarity. So basically, mm. Ethereum made the decision to transition to proof of stake before there was legal clarity from the SEC, defining mm -hmm. what who defining who they were going to go after. Mm -hmm. So first they started talking about DeFi. Now there's mm -hmm. legal clarity on DeFi. And now Ethereum is sort of stuck because they were transitioning to proof of stake already. So it's like, what do you do? Uh, well, you try to figure it out. I think in my theory, look, it's just me being, you know, theorizing that they have to sort of delay this uh, until they figure out how to move forward without being uh, sanctioned. Because the SEC also were clear that all of Ethereum falls under US jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they, they claim that look look if you're anything apart it doesn't matter where in the world you are if you're a part of this network you fall under united states uh the united states government's jurisdiction and so it's like they're the sec is setting setting the table already um and so like you know we're waiting you know to see what happens yeah and it also may be because it it could potentially be that they're trying to protect everybody in there mm -hmm. and just say okay well we need to know what to do next because they came up with the gas for you know the classic ethereum right to get around some rules there so they're just trying they're trying to see where the punch is coming from so they can get out of the way and yeah. and help their investors uh so it may be for good right but what mm -hmm. struck me about this conversation it's very interesting is all the flavors of like investor and like what people are going for because we 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 have this conversation but it's really like comparing apples to habanero peppers it's very very <laughs> different right? um they're they're very specifically you know so we're describing two different moving targets and i totally get ethereum and again i'm not i'm not a maxi i'm not a maxi at all i i think you know Bitcoin is digital gold. It really is. And that is that is right. The Constitution, it's 21 million. That's all that's going to be done. Mm -hmm. It is a very, very specific case for use. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Ethereum, you build products on top of Ethereum. And maybe it does need to be 
a little bit more. Maybe it needs to evolve more. Maybe there now does it meet the definition of blockchain um, the way it was intended to be? Probably not. But I mean, if Ari and I have had this conversation over and over and over <laughs> again, like people, if you just Google and the the masses out there, they'll do types of blockchain. <sighs> <laughs> and it'll pull up four different types, but you know, Ari maintains that there's only one blockchain, right? Um, and 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 most Bitcoiners I know are like, there's only one blockchain, but it's going to be really hard to convince six billion people out there <clears throat> that there are multiple types of blockchains, and that Bitcoin's is just a very specific one. Um, which Bitcoin likes to call itself BitChain or Time Chain to try and differentiate <laughs> itself in the world of blockchain. <laughs> But it's amazing, like there, people yeah. have different mindsets, right? The Bitcoiners right. have a tendency to be more financially, um, more investor types and, and more financial services and a lot more economics. Whereas, you know, we get people who are builders on Ethereum. They want to build a company. They want to do something on there. They want to use uh, the platform for something. So mm -hmm. just kind of an interesting thing as I'm sitting here uh, being quiet, mm -hmm. I just thought I'd chime in and throw that in there. <laughs> I mean to, to even to even chime in on the you know Ethereum is for builders, right? Mm -hmm. I, I I then start to question, all right, you know, why there's so many cheaper ways and more efficient ways to build <laughs> a, a software. Why am I paying why pay all of these gas fees? It's it's like typically it's when you're using technology or just in the technology space, it's things are supposed to be cheaper over the over time. Like our phones, our cell phones right now are doing the kind of things that it used to take 20 grand worth of like office equipment to do, right? Mm -hmm. And so we pay what, $500 to a grand, you know, to be able to do all of these awesome things because technology gets cheaper over time. It's, it's hard to look at Ethereum as an invention or an advancement when it's, one of the only technologies that I can see now that's like things are more expensive, <laughs> right? So simple applications that would have been basically free to do in Web 2.0 that you're spending, you know, what, $500, $800 in gas fees to now execute these same, these same you know, um, um, transactions and access these same kind of features. And so if I'm giving away, if it's more expensive, what am I, what am I getting for? Is it more efficient? Is it faster and etc. I'll tell you this, look, as a Bitcoiner, Bitcoin is horrible for daily spending. It's slow as hell. It's, it's hard. If you want to, you got to use the layer two, something else, not Bitcoin, but you're giving up speed for security and privacy. That's what you're giving up. It's like, okay, fine. It's slow as heck, but at least the government can't come after my Bitcoin because they don't have my keys. So I'm willing to give that up. What do we why are we giving up all of this money in exchange for what? What about these dApps are more effective or more useful than the applications that we can just use on and access online, you know, outside of speculating and getting insanely rich off of food tokens like I did, you know? <laughs> so, and um, I can, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, like, I, I think for, like, for myself, like, I live in a, I live in a first world country. Um, a lot of the people here don't necessarily need a lot of the things that are being built. Um, I would say the majority of like the applications that are being developed aren't necessarily meant and built for people in first world countries. They're people who, for people who are like underbanked, underserved in the financial world. You can get things in like the DeFi world that are significantly better um, than what you can get in the first world country or in a first world country. You can get better yield um, on your money. Does it come with different types of risks? Of course. Uh, but there are different things that you can do with your capital to essentially protect yourself. Um, can those types of things come with risk? Of course. Um, it's a very different risk than what you can do in like the traditional financial market. Nothing that you're doing is technically insured. There's like these decentralized insurance markets that are being built, but I've never used them. And I don't think that they're that efficient. Um, they're evolving though. But uh, I mean, there's things that you can do in like the DeFi world that are significantly better. 
Um, there are a lot of scaling solutions that are being evolved. I, I think, I mean, we obviously learned about like the Lightning Network uh, years and years ago, and that's started to evolve quite a lot within the Bitcoin um, ecosystem. Um, and now like within the Ethereum world, uh, we're starting to see a lot of, a lot of these scaling solutions starting to really, really, um, grow and evolve. Do they come with different types of risks? Yeah. Uh, you're dealing with new technologies. Um, and I mean, I've been building around like the Ethereum scaling world for the last like three years. And that whole ecosystem is starting to really flourish and it's really blossoming. Um, and it's, it's awesome to see where people who can now go and essentially pay for these quote unquote DeFi services and paying network fees that are literally just pennies. Um, and once we have things like proto dank sharding, it's going to be like a fraction of a penny um, where uh, call data is massively decreased by like 100x. Uh, so like the call data that you store on, on mainnet um, is decreased significantly. Um, obviously that probably won't be live for my guess is like another six to nine months. Um, just because usually when like an EIP comes and is introduced, uh, it takes like 18 to 24 months for something like that to come into production. Um, so we're probably not going to see it for a little while, but from the actual scaling perspective, I mean, it's, it's really starting to blossom. We're seeing a lot of enterprises starting to build proof of concepts. Uh, some of them are starting to do things in production. Um, and I don't know, I, I, I think it's pretty exciting. So, and, and Jimmy, also when you had mentioned, um, you know, why build? in this space when it's, you know, more expensive. Um, well, and again, I'll refer to a, a, a balcony, I, Gary's heard me tell, tell this before. First of all, it's just, the, it's the next thing, right? People want to be a part of the next thing. Number two is that you can pull uh, better invest. I mean, investors are still excited about web three and crypto and all this stuff. And they're still pouring money into it. I was at a balcony party a few weeks ago um, at a law firm. And um, I was just going around talking to all the lawyers who'd been drinking uh, for a while. And they were just saying like, yeah, there's still lots of money coming into this, uh, into this industry. They're still, you know, attracting a lot of investors. And, you know, if I want to go build, and I used to work at Blue Origin and Jeff Bezos was actually in the, uh, in the facility multiple times a week. And, you know, I used to have to present something to him, but he got up, uh, he got up and he was talking about, the early internet and how there was like, he even said balls.com. Um, balls.com is you could buy online any type of ball, tennis balls, golf balls, basket. It was just balls, right? And so that was sort of the explosion of the internet when all these dot coms started coming out. It's sort of the same thing here is that there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of people just throwing money at stuff, whether it has value or not. I think we're all kind of seeing a little bit of a shakeout right now. And this, uh -huh. uh, and I, and thank you, thank you so much, thank you, because I agree with everything you said. There's a lot of hype, and it's easy to fundraise. Full stop. Awesome. If you want to <laughs> fundraise, say your company has a token. You want to open up a, a, pet, a pet store, doggy token, bro. Fund me. <laughs> you get an investment. Look, I, look, I get it. But what I don't like, <clears throat> because I, I told you guys, I'm a, I'm a truth maxi is people saying, this is the future of such and such. <laughs> this is changing the way we do such and such. And, and you're right, uh, and you're right, Mark. Like DeFi does offer access to things that people in poorer countries don't have, but they don't have it because their own currency isn't worth as much as toilet paper. I mean, the Congo is Zimbabwe Yes, your yam token is attractive to me. But the thing is, I now am better off because I, I have access to yam token, but I bought said yam token from Jimmy in America. See that those poor people are my exit liquidity. They would never be able to afford the amount of ETH to then have enough to spend on the gas fees, fees required to yield as much as me, right? And so when I'm ready to sell 
my e liquid yam tokens, they're my exit liquidity. And so when it goes down, they're hurt. So yeah, they're getting access to things they don't have access to in the interim, but they're screwed in the end. So I, I so there's there's two things that you're that you're mentioning there. One is I guess like scam tokens. Yeah. But I would love to rid ourselves of that entirely. Like we don't we don't need them. Um, scam tokens are, they do nothing good for the entire ecosystem as a whole. Um, I mean, it just, it puts, it paints a bad picture. It hurts people. Uh, people obviously do become exit liquidity. And I, I don't know if anybody generally likes them other than like the potential of, Ooh, I might be able to make a quick buck. That's about it. Um, and that just ends up hurting someone else in the end. Um, and then like the second point is around like gas fees. Um, which I don't think anybody like maybe some like maxis would be like, oh, it's like healthy for the ecosystem and things like that. Uh, I mean, in some sense, yeah, it can incentivize more people to become a node and like secure a network, uh, regardless of what the underlying chain is, uh, whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, whatever, it, whatever it is. Um, the more that's being paid, it makes it hopefully more secure, generally speaking. Um, but I, I'm, I'm really, really excited to see how a lot of the scaling solutions are, a lot of which are now in production and are now being like used on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, like if you haven't really dug into that, are there a lot of like pros and cons with them? Yeah, there, there are. I'm not going to like deny that. Um, and a lot of them are very new and could potentially have um, like bugs and potential vulnerabilities. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend digging into what's being built there. Uh, there's actually some that are being built specifically for Bitcoin um, to allow for, uh, there's one team, I don't know if you're familiar with them, uh, Starkware, uh, they're working on uh, building out a virtual machine on top of Bitcoin uh, using a proof system called a ZK Stark, uh, which will essentially help to A, scale Bitcoin uh, while helping to retain its security um, and allowing you to build all kinds of different types of custom programs on top of it. They're the team who's also building uh, a product on Ethereum called StarkNet, um, which is like the first uh, Turing complete rollup. Um, so you can just go and like deploy any kind of smart contract there. Um, so there's a lot of really, really cool stuff that's being built there. Um, and definitely recommend, um, digging into it. Uh, but that's like a, a rabbit hole for, <laughs> for another day. Um, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. Steve, you just unmuted. You want to add something? Oh, no, I was just, just unmuting for for the sake okay. of one, um, just in case something popped up. But I, I, I it's been a, a great conversation. I think um, you know the thing is when the the the, the Bitcoiners and Mark, we may have an uphill battle, man. Um, you know the the Bitcoiners don't don't like change. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> so, I, like, and I, I totally and I get that. Again, like Bitcoin is is it's there. It's kind of like a tank. It just keeps rolling and rolling and it's super duper secure. And, you know, everything else just kind of these projects that flourish kind of, they spark my interest because I'm a tinkerer. I love to, I love dabbling in different things and I love seeing what these new things are. I wouldn't go so far as to say, this is like Jimmy said, this is the future. This is the future of this. I, I, I don't know. Like there literally could be a piece of technology that just wipes half of that stuff out. Um, that comes along or legislation for that matter. Um, yeah. But I think it's kind of an exciting ride and um, seeing some of the potential there also kind of sparks my imagination. What can I build in this space? I didn't, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jimmy, go. Yeah, and just to you know, chime in, like I said, I keep repeating, I'm not one of those toxic max. Look, I advise, you know, clients that are not, you know, building on Bitcoin, right? And, and they're, you know, how they're using blockchain technology makes sense to them, right? You have these gaming companies that are, you know, GameFi is emerging. GameFi is being funded like crazy now. And, you know, they're using 
you know, the technology in interesting ways because they had challenges. You know, for example, you know, imagine you're designing a game and, and you know, you're sort of increasing the difficulty level of, of you know, over time and people, you know, players sort of sort of black market for, you know, skins or tools to now advance faster, which is completely destroying your game design, right? Because now it turned into a, a pay to win to win model, right? It just destroys competition. And so, you know, a lot of gaming companies are now starting these marketplaces, you know, selling these in-game assets as NFTs to control um, um, that, to manage that. Um, because, you know, without, you know, a blockchain or without a marketplace that operates on a blockchain, it's done in the black market and, it, and it, it's hard to really control. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's a bunch of other use cases that people are sort of looking to, to blockchain technology for. I just don't buy into a lot of what's being marketed or I tend to push back when people are dishonest about what's happening. Just be honest about what's happening and then just, you know, make as much money as you want. I get it, like, you know, don't tell me this PFP NFT is the future. Like, bro, it's it's a cartoon rock. You guys, you guys remember that? When that moon, I don't know if you guys were following when the rocks, like, come on guys, like just, <laughs> just, just, just let's be honest. I'm glad you made money, but don't tell me this is an innovation, man. Like, come on, you know, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I think with that, uh, that kind of wraps it up. I, I learned a lot. It was really, really interesting to like po poke on the nuances and like learn about the different frameworks and mental models. And um, I think maybe it is something that those in either community or both communities or all communities need to be a lot more crystal clear about um, helping set um, clarity for newcomers that come into the space to properly engage which mental model and, and what is going on really here um, properly so that they aren't surprised or they don't have uh, misaligned or um, un unrealistic expectations about what they're really getting into. Um, and, you know, I'm not a, I cannot see the future. I don't think most of us can. And so, you know, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, but uh Jimmy, thank you so much for your time and hopping on a call. I, I'd love to chat more maybe in the near future about, you know, uh, proof of solvency and proof of assets and proof of liabilities. I think that would be really interesting. Um, and Mark, thank you so much for, you know, hopping on very last minute to talk about, you know, the Ethereum perspective and Steve as well. And uh, um, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right, thank you. Thank you. It's always right. a pleasure. Cheers, y'all. Happy Monday. Take care. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Yep. All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Windshield Time, y'all. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is a non-technical, fun, informative way to learn about money, Bitcoin, blockchains, crypto, and digital assets for busy parents and working folks who are curious about these new technologies. Day, Ari, and their guests talk about these evolutionary systems of money and what they do, y'all. Because what part of your life does money not touch? This podcast is not financial advice, and your reactions are your total and complete responsibility, y'all. Now, thanks again, and enjoy the show. Stuck in sack.